So what you want to do with the attachment is you want to download it. So here I have uh, the file sqlclass.zip. It is a, a zip format, which means it has to be unzipped or uncompacted. So here's what you would do. Once you download that file, then in this case, I'll double click on it. And then it opens up this window. And then I'm going to pick in the word extract all. Oh, by the way, sometimes my mouse will do that so you can find my mouse. So I'll pick on extract all. And then let's say you're going to put it into uh, a folder. So I'll call this one SQL class two, whatever the folder that you want to call it is fine. That's arbitrary. So I'll pick on uh, extract. That's going to have a lot of the sample files that I'll be using today. So you don't have to actually type in the code and you'll be able to practice, you know, during this session or probably after the session will be better. Now, these are all individual listings of the FTL code. I'm not going to use all of those today, but I'm going to use some of this. Now, what you really have to do if you want to practice along with this is you have to create the actual databases. And that's what this file does. So watch what I'm going to do. That's now unzipped and those files are ready to be used. So now I'm going to go into the actual SQL Server over here. Now, these files, for the most part, should work with uh, Microsoft SQL Server. They'll work with other databases as well, but sometimes you'll have to change the code a little bit. So here I am in the SQL Server Management Studio, which is where you can run the actual SQL code. Uh, so hopefully you have access to some kind of database. Now, within this database, within this server here, I'm going to make a new database. So you see where it says databases right there? I'm going to right click on the word databases and I'm going to go ahead and make a new database. If you are not able to do this, maybe your IT team can make a new database for you. And I'm just going to call this one uh, new books. That's the name of the database, all right? New books. And I'll click on OK. So now that database is made. Let's see if it's going to be there. So I'm going to go ahead and expand the databases uh, uh, icon here. And there's the one that's called new books. Now let's see how we're actually going to run the, uh, load the tables up. See, that's just a blank database right now. The tables that we need for the session are not there yet. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to come up here and I'll pick on file and then open, and we're going to open a file. All right, so we say file open. And this way you can open up the, those files that I sent to you. In this case, uh, I'm going to go to that same folder and I'm going to pick on the books uh, underscore SQL server that SQL file. I'll pick on open. Notice how this file actually creates the tables that we're going to use and it inserts the records. So this should run perfectly fine. Now, uh, m make sure up here you're in the proper database. All right. I want to put this in the database that we just made or a database that you have access to. So I'll pick on the word execute and it runs. Now it might give you this message because it says to drop that table, but if the table isn't there, you know, it can't drop it, but then it just makes the table and it starts to records and you can see it seemed to work out pretty well. Here's how we can tell that it did work out. I'm going to go ahead and uh, go ahead and refresh the tables here. So I'll right click on the word tables and I'll pick a refresh. And now you'll see all those tables that we're going to use are, are right there. Uh, so these are just small little tables, but they're going to be great for, to help us uh, demonstrate the SQL code. So now let me show you why I sent you those files, everybody, because I don't really want to be typing <laughs> and I don't want you to be typing either as you're learning this session. So all you really have to do is uh, you make sure your SQL server is open. I just showed you that it is open. Now you just go back to the folder where you unzip those files and you can just double click on the individual files. So let's take a look at this first one. Again, I'm not going to run all of these. I just want to show you certain examples. So notice when I double click on that, it just opens up that code right into your SQL server. So um, the first statement that you want to learn in your SQL is the select statement. So the select statement is where we can uh, choose different fields from a table. So I'm choosing the uh, basically the first name and the last name from the author's table. 
Now the comma is going to separate the fields. Notice how there's a comma between each field. You can really have as many fields as you wanted to. So I'm going to go ahead and execute. Oh, let me show you something. I'm going to pick a different database right now. Let's say I pick the, the master database. So when I execute it this time, it'll say, hey, I don't know, you know what, that ta what, what table that you're referring to. So you want to make sure that you are in the proper database that we just created. So I'll go back to the new books database. That's really important. That's a common error that people run into. They try to run the code, but if it's not in the proper database, you'll get this kind of message. Now I'm going to go ahead and pick on execute. And now you see it shows the first name and the last name from the author's table. All right, so now we're getting started. So the nice part about this is, uh, you know, you can see what the code looks like and we can uh, execute it. If you download those sample files, you can just do what I'm doing without having to type it in. So let's go into this one that's called Listing 401. Uh, now this time it'll just select the city from the author's table and we're going to pick on Execute. Now the uh, semicolon at the end is actually optional. If, if you don't have that, it, it would still work if I pick on Execute. And then we get the cities from that table, right? So the select line is going to be important when you have more than one field, uh, then you would separate it with a comma. Now in this case, I'm going to purposely make it not work. Uh, I'll say select city one from authors. And it's going to say that field name is not the correct field name. So you have to look at the messages and it'll tell you what line the, uh, the, the error is in. And then it says in, invalid column name. So most of the time, the messages that you get are, you know, pretty straightforward. And usually it'll tell you which line that it needs to be corrected. So of course, instead of city one, I'll type in city and that one will work. Let's go back to some of these other listings. So I'll go to, uh, we'll, we'll do some basic select statements first. So notice how with this one, I'm se separating the fields with a comma. Last, uh, first name, last name, city, state. Oh, by the way, here's how you can tell what the field names would be. I'm gonna come over here to the tables, right? I'm gonna uh, right click, uh, pick on this arrow. And then if you expand the word columns, then you can see the actual field names. So that's one way. And there's multiple ways. Uh, another way is I can right click on that table, right click and say select top 1000 rows. And then that would show you the field names. Okay, and you have to type in the field names exactly. So I'm gonna close this window now. So this time it's gonna select the first name, last name, city and state from the author's table. Notice how the field names are separated with a comma and the fields are gonna uh, display in that order. When I pick on execute, so now look what it tells you down here. If you look at the bottom, it'll tell you how many rows will match that that cry, you know, that, that search. Okay. Uh, so of course we're starting simple and we'll move on from there. Let's uh, go back to another one. Listing 403. Now in this case, it says select asterisk from authors. That means select all of the fields. And in this case, it will show all of the records. So if you ever see the asterisk in the code, that means select all of the fields. It's kind of shorthand for that. Now let's go back to um, our examples here and I'm going to go to listing 405. Now notice how it has the word as here. Uh, these are called aliases. So in other words, when I run the query, the, instead of showing uh, AUF name, the column heading will be first name. So when you have the word as there, you're going to give the field a different name. We call that an alias. So let's see what it's going to show us. The first name, the last name, the city, the state, and then the zip. Instead of calling it zip, it'll call a postal code. Go ahead, we'll pick on execute. And then you can see how you can, uh, the field names have been changed. By the way, anytime that you run these queries, any one of these can be exported to a, uh, a CSV file. So in this case, if I just right click on the results down here, and you say save results as, and you're going to save it to a CSV file, which is a really common format that can be imported into, you know, any other database, including Excel. So you give it a name. It's going to be a CSV file and I'll pick on save and that file was just created on my computer. 
then I can use it in other databases. So when you run these queries, especially in the Microsoft SQL Server, I'm just going to right click there and then I'll say save results as, and you can actually save it as a CSV file. The important one about this example was the as, and that's, the, that's what we call an alias. Uh, let's go to uh, 406. So uh, I want to show you, uh, this one's going to select every single record and show the state field. So I'll pick on execute. And notice how uh, there are seven records there. New York is in there twice. California is in there three times and so on. Well, what if I just wanted to show New York one time and California one time and so on? So then let's try another example. I'm going to go to listing 407. Uh, when I say distinct, that means it'll get rid of any duplicates. Select distinct. So if I pick on execute, then notice how California is only in there once and Colorado is only in there once. Now, watch where my mouse is going to go. All the uh, queries that I've been using are still open. So I can go back to these previous windows, as you can see. So notice how this one showed all of the states for all of the records. And then when I picked on this one, because of the word dis uh, distinct, it only shows you, you know, each one just one time. It got rid of the duplicates. So that's a good example to know about. Let's keep on going now. Uh, let's see what 408 has to say. Uh, so again, we're selecting city and state from the authors. I'm going to go ahead. Uh, so I'm going to click on the, the code here. You really want to make sure that it is in the correct database. This is a common error that people make. So if I pick the master database and I pick on execute, it just doesn't know what that is, you know? But then I'll come over here and make sure we pick on the new books database and we'll pick on execute. Good. Now the order, like if I had state comma city, then the state would be first. All right. So the order that you have them here is going to be the order that they display when you run the query. Uh, let's go to uh, 409. 409 will be another example of the um, of the distinct. So if we take a look at this one, San Francisco is in there twice, right? Now, uh, in this one, the combination of the city and state will be what's going to show up. So here, New York is in there twice as a state, but the combination of the city and the, and the state is what has to be distinct. All right, so uh, it's not just the distinct city, it's the combination of the city and the state that has to be the unique combination. So that was that example there. Uh, let's take a look at another one. Okay, so the next really important thing that you need to know about your queries is being able to sort the query in the proper order. Let's take a look at listing 410. And then we're going to use something that's called order by. That means you're going to sort it by that field. Uh, now, ASC means ascending, and then if you want it in reverse order, you would put DESC, which means descending. It turns out that the ASC is actually optional. If it's in ascending order, you don't really have to put ASC. I'll pick on uh, execute. Now, the last names are in alphabetical order, as we can see. If I take away that ASC, then I'll pick on Execute, and now it still worked. So the ASC is optional. If I wanted the last names to be in reverse order, then I'll come over here and I'll type in DESC for descending or reverse order. And now you can see the last names are in a reverse order. Okay, So the order by is going to be important when you want to sort the query. Let's take a look in, uh, at another example of that. Let's take a look at listing 411. Uh, so this is one that has the, the first name descending, D-E-S-C. Right? You can see the first name is now in reverse order. Let's take a look at listing um, 416. So I have some uh, examples that I want to show you. Now in this case, this is a, a, uh, this is a sort by three fields. You have your select statement. There's the as, right, the aliases. Uh, the from is the table name. And then the order by, it's going to sort by the state. 
Then when the state is the same, it'll sort by last name within the state. And then when the last name is the same, it'll sort by first name. So you can sort by multiple fields, really as many as you wanted to. Uh, in this case, um, they're going to be separated by a comma. So I'm going to go ahead and execute that. And now let's see what happened. So all the Californias are together. Within California, the hulls are together. And within hull, they're sort of in alphabetical order. So notice how it says order by state. Again, the ascending is really optional, but it's nice to have that. Then the last name and then the first name. Notice how it's sorting by the alias name. All right, so when we have an alias name, we can sort by that as well. Now remember, if you're going to use the code that I gave you on different servers, like on Oracle or Access, you might have to make minor changes to the code. Like sometimes they might use single quotes instead of double quotes. So I'm just letting you know that uh, there might be minor changes if you use this SQL code in different servers. However, most of it should be exactly the same as what I'm talking about. So let's go back uh, and try some other examples now. Let's try listing 417. Now this one is going to have a calculation. So I have the title ID, the price, the sales. Now look at this one. I'm taking the price times the sales and it's going to use the same kind of math that you might use in Excel. So notice how it's using the asterisk for multiplication like Excel and Access uses. And then we're going to call that field revenue. So let's go ahead and run that one and it's going to sort it by the revenue. So the higher numbers are up top here. Okay. So we have the price times the sales is going to give us the revenue. So if I go ahead and uh, I'm going to highlight this line and right now I'll just delete that. Uh, of course, we can always undo, but I'm going to pick on execute and notice how in this case, well, the reason that this is not working is because I have a comma there and then there's nothing after the comma, right? So I'm going to get rid of that comma. Then we're going to execute that again. And now it will work. Oh, I see. It doesn't know what the revenue is. So we'll say uh, order by, in this case, the price. Right? So because we deleted that field. So now it's sorted by the price, right? So now I'm going to go ahead and undo. And now you see how we have the extra field price times sales, and it's going to come up as revenue. And now it's going to sort by the revenue order by. Um, I'm going to pick an execute. Now in this case, so you start, you start to get pretty good at why it doesn't work properly. So I have the price times the sales. Okay, I see what just happened there. This is kind of interesting. If you highlight a piece of the code, then when you execute it, only that one piece actually uh, is the thing that works. So it didn't run the whole thing there. That's when I just clicked away from that. So nothing is highlight. Then when I execute it, it does work. So that could be kind of interesting. If you run into a message and you know that code is correct, but if maybe you have some highlight and you try to execute that, it's only going to run the highlight, highlight code. Right, so I'll just click away from that and then run it. And then it's going to run just fine. Now we have that revenue field back again. So we could do math into our uh, examples as well. You have as many fields uh, and you know, you're going to mix and match all these building blocks to make your queries. So this time, let's go to uh, listing 418. So we saw the order by. Now the next ones are going to start to show you how you can select certain records. Sometimes you don't want to see every record. So then we're going to get into using the where statement. All right. So the where statement is going to be your criteria. Uh, so this one says the last name is not going to be equal to hull. When I have the less than and the greater than next to each other, that means not equal to. So I'll pick an execute. See how the last name does not equal null. If I want the ones where the last name does equal hull, uh, hull then I'm going to type in the equal sign there instead of the not equals, and we'll pick on execute. And now we see the ones that are hull, right? So we can say not equal to or less than or greater than, you know, those kind of things. The original one said not equal to hull. 
Now, if I take that criteria off, it'll show me everything, right? So there's hull, and there's the ones that are not equal to hull. So then the where is going to be where we just show the records that meet that certain criteria. Now, look what happened. See, I just said it. I highlighted that code, and it only ran that code that I have highlighted. So then if I click away from that, then it'll run. Let's go to uh, listing 420. Now, in this case, it's using, uh, I want to see all of the titles where the publisher's date, uh, you're going to type in the date as the year, month, and day. Now, this is kind of interesting. Um, this code can be used in different servers. So I'm going to try to execute this one on the SQL server. And it actually doesn't like that word date. So maybe in other versions of the SQL Server code, the word date would be there. In my version of SQL Server, I'm going to remove the word date. So now it says where publisher's date is greater than or equal to basically January 1st of 2001. So when you type in your dates, you're going to use a year, month, day. Good. And now, now that's because that uh, publisher's date is a date and time field. Let me show you what I mean by that. If we come over here and we look at the titles table, I'm going to go ahead and right click on the titles table. Maybe you'll have access to your tables like this where you can, uh, where you can go into design view. So I right click and pick on design view. And then we see all the field names and then we see the data types. So notice how that publisher's date is a date and time field. These other ones are text fields. INT is a, uh, an integer. Here's a decimal field. Here's a small integer. So because that's a date and time field, I can do a date range. So this will give me everything uh, on or after January 1st, 2001. And you can see that's exactly what happened. So uh, you can see how we can use the criteria to do a date range or uh, that one is everything after that date. Soon we'll see another one that will have an actual date range. So this time, by the way, I have all these files open, right? If I go back to all these windows, I would see all the other documents. Uh, in this case, I don't really need to save those. So I'm gonna right click up there and I'll say close all the uh, open documents. And you know, I don't really have to save those right now. I'll click on uh, no. If, of course, if you made changes to those, then you might want to save the files again. So I'll go back to my files. In this case, let me go to listing 420. That's the one that we just did. Now remember, when you guys try to run this in the SQL Server, we're going to remove the word date. And then I'll pick an execute. Most of these files should work on the SQL Server. But sometimes you might have to make some minor changes uh, if you try to run these. And then you can always look online for the exact syntax if you run into an issue, uh, if you're going to, you know, whatever server that you'll be using. So let's go back to our files again. Let's try listing 421. Now, in this case, we have a calculation in the criteria. So we're saying where price times the sales is greater than 1 million. So we're going to pick on execute. Right, so you can even have calculations in the criteria. And you can see it came up with all the ones that were greater than um, one, one million. Uh, so for the next example, let's do a more complicated type of where. So I'll go to listing 422. See, I mean, I'm showing you simple examples, but you can really make these as complicated as you need. So now the type is going to be biography and the price has to be less than 20. So you could have as many ands as you want. You can have as many ors as you want and these kind of things. So notice how the type is equal to biography and the price is less than $20. Uh, I'm sure that's a number field. When we have a number field, the criteria does not have to be in quotes. But notice how the text and the date fields, the criteria does have to be in quotes. So you do get used to the syntax. The only way you're going to get better at the SQL language is to practice with it. So that's why I sent those files over. So you can actually load up these tables 
and then practice with these exact files and then start making your changes to the code. And that's how you're going to start to learn it. So let's go back now. Uh, let's try one, uh, the 420, we did 422. Let's go to 423, listing 423. This has um, three criteria. So the last name has to be uh, started with an H or anything after H, greater than or equal to H. So basically we're saying the last name has to be between H and Z. We want all the last names between the H and Z. Uh, and the state cannot be equal to California. So you can start to see, you can really have more complicated types of uh, solutions. So I'll pick on execute. And then notice how the last names are between H and Z, and they're not from California, when we have the, the not equal to, right? Now let's talk about the structure of this code. Usually I'll put the select line on one statement. Usually I'll put the from line on its own line. And then the where line, I mean here it doesn't have to be split into three lines like that. Uh, I'm gonna make it all on one line. And it would work that way as well. So you can structure it any way you wanted to. And you could put the whole thing on one big line if you wanted to, but usually I'll put the select statement on one line. I'll put the from on its own line and the where on another line. So I'll pick on execute and now it still works. Now that's a good point. Let's incorporate the order by. Let's say I want these ordered by the state. All right, so remember how we did order by. I wanna show you something really important. So after the from, I'm going to type in order by, and then we'll type in the state. Now notice when I type that in, the SQL server that I'm using does help you. So as you start to type it in, the field might show up, uh, you know, and then I can double click it from there. So watch what's going to happen. I'm going to execute that. It doesn't like the fact that the order by is before the where. So if you have the where statement and the order by statement in the same code, the order by has to appear after the where. So watch what I'll do. In this case, we're just going to copy and paste that. So, uh, or cut and paste it will be fine. Now I notice that the uh, semicolon is there. So I'm going to get rid of the semicolon because that tells us that will be the end. And then I'm going to go ahead and run that work, paste it in. So now I have the exact same code except the where is before the order by, and then it'll run, okay? And now they're sorted by the state, as we can say. Now, here's what I was talking about with the semicolon. If I type in that semicolon, that really tells the, that really tells it that's the end of the code. So if it sees something after the semicolon, it's not gonna like that. Yeah, it says, you know, hey, uh, the semicolon tells me that's the end, but you have something after that, all right? so. In this case, the semicolon is extraneous. And when I get rid of that, I pick on execute. So you really have to be very, very specific with this code. And notice how even with that one, the order by had to appear after the where. And, uh, you know, that's, I had to take that semicolon off. So after a while, you get used to what needs to change. But, I mean, you have to get this exactly, exactly right. That's why with these examples, at least you have them so you, you don't have to type them in. Uh, let's see. Let's go to listing 423. And I'm just double clicking on these, by the way. And then they open up. So that's the one that we were just in. Uh, so let's go to listing uh, 424. 424 has an or, right? So we can have and or or. So this one's going to say the state equals New York or the state equals Colorado, or the city is San Francisco. So you can have ands and ors and different combinations of these things, right? So I'll pick an execute. So then we have some that are New York, some that are Colorado, and then we have some that are San Francisco because of the or. All right, so just different ways to do it. Hopefully you're getting some ideas of how you can get your SQL started. Let's go to listing 425. So this one has, um, we're using the parentheses. Now, uh, this one says where the state equals California or where the state does not equal to California. So it's kind of a weird example. It's basically going to show us everything. It's where the state 
uh, equals California and the state does not equal to California. Now, this is kind of interesting. Uh, let me take that away for a second. If I run it without that code, there's one that says null there. All right. Null is going to be an empty field. However, if I put that those lines back in, the state equals California or the state does not equal California, it's not including the nulls. So that was kind of an interesting way to uh, not show the nulls there. All right, so I'm saying we're a state. So that's one way to show uh, if I didn't want to see the nulls. But let's talk about the nulls. So we'll say where state, you can try uh, equals just like, uh, the empty the empty set there. Let's see if that gave us the null. Uh, so not like that. How about if we did? There's a lot of functions that are built into the SQL code. So I'll say is null, and then you can see that would be an appropriate response. And I'll type in the word state there. Um, so where uh, is null state? So I see. In this case, it needs a second parameter. All right. So. You could try different things like that. But why don't we try something like state um, equals null. Let's see if that one works. So in this case, when I just ran it, if I click on execute, then the null does come up. Uh, it was kind of interesting how we did it. In this case, let's go back. This one uh, will we'll show the ones that are not null. No. That was an interesting way to show that. Good. So now let's go to another listing. In this case, uh, let's go to listing 427. Now you can use the word not to negate um, the criteria. So it says where not price is less than 20. So that means the price is going to be greater than or equal to 20 and the sales will be greater than or equal to 15,000. So notice how the price is more than 20 because it says not price less than 20, right? So you can put the not before any criteria to get the negation of that. So that's another keyword, not. I'm just trying to show you many uh, different examples here so you can get the idea of how to work with these. Uh, let's go to another listing. Oh, okay. Let's do a wild card. So if I go to listing 430. So in this case, we're using a wild card. We have the word like there. That's a reserved word. So I have K E L and the percent sign. Now in, uh, in other databases, uh, sometimes I've seen it be the asterisk or something like, or maybe the pound sign could be the wild card. In this version of the SQL Server, it'll be the uh, percent sign. In this case, I'll pick on execute. And now it has the ones that start with KEL. And the percent sign means it doesn't mean what's after that. So it doesn't matter what's after KEL. Let's try another example of the wildcard. So if I want the ones all that all start with H, I'll type in H and then the percent sign, and it'll give me everything that starts with H. Here's another way to use the, the wild card. Let's go to listing 431. Now, the underscore is a wild card that is a certain, it's just one character. So this means uh, there's actually two underscores there. So what I'm really saying there is it doesn't matter what the first character is. It doesn't matter what the second character is, as long as the third and fourth characters are else. So I'll pick on execute. And now notice how um, uh, in all four of these, the third and fourth characters specifically are else. So the underscore means a single character wildcard. So in other words, I uh, it doesn't matter. I have two underscores there. So it doesn't matter what's the first character. It doesn't matter what's the second character. Uh, as long as the third and fourth character are else. Now let's see what happens. I just want to say the third character is going to be L. It doesn't, and then I have the percent sign after that. It doesn't matter what's after the L. And that gave us the same kind of result. Okay. So a couple different wildcards there. The percent sign means 
It could be, you know, anything and, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how many characters there are. The underscore is a single character wildcard. So let's see. In this case, that means the second character is going to be L. Let's see if there's any of this. And there's none of this. How about if we made the second character E? And then we have some of this. Okay. You see how it doesn't matter what's in the first character as long as the second character is E. And then the percent sign means it doesn't mean, matter what's after the, um, the E. So we have the like there. And then you can see how different ways we could do the asterisk, uh, the, the wildcard. Now, on the other hand, this one will mean I want E in there somewhere. It doesn't matter where the E is going to appear as long as the E is in there somewhere. So I'll pick on execute because I have a uh, percent sign E percent sign. So here I have uh, Haydmark, Kells, Kelsey, and then the E is over here on this one, right? So different ways to do your wild cards and those come up in real life. Uh, let's do a range. So in this case, I'm going to go to listing 435. Here's another important operator between between this and that. So where the zip code, in this case, I have the word not between those two numbers. And then you can see the result is not between uh, 2000, I mean, 20,000 and 8999. What if I wanted the ones that were between that? So I'll get rid of the word not, we'll pick an execute. And then you can see those are clearly between those two numbers. Now, in this case, I also want them ordered by the zip. So I'll say order by zip. So you're going to mix and match all of these different examples, right? We'll pick on execute. And now they're ordered by the zip code. On the other hand, if I say not between, like it was before, that'll give me the ones that are not between those two zip codes and they'll be ordered by the zip code, as you can see. Right, so where is going to be important for us? The order by is going to be important for us. Between is how we do uh, a range. Let's see another one with a range. So I'm going to do 436. Um, Let's think 436. Oh, so this is a number field where the price is between 10 and 1995. Remember when I said it's a number field, the criteria does not have to be in quotes. Good. All right, so those are all the ones between 10 and 1995. Let's see uh, one that'll have a date range. So let me go to listing 437. Okay, now remember what I said in this version of the SQL Server, I do not need the word date there. In some versions, it might need that word date. In this case, I do not. And I could have put all of that on one line. That's what I, I usually put it on one line. So it's going to be between 1 slash 1 slash 2000 and 12 slash 31 slash 2000. That's where we can do a date range, assuming that, of course, is a date field. Uh, here's another one that comes up, another way to put the criteria in. Uh, let's go to listing 439. We can use the in. So that means the state is either New York or NJ or California, right? Before I used that or operator, of course, that would work. Kind of a shortcut way to do that is in. So this says not in. So I want the ones that are not New York, New Jersey, or California. And you can see it came up with Colorado and Florida. Naturally, if I get rid of the word not, then it'll show me the ones that are in New York, New Jersey, and California. So another operator that you want to know about is in. And then you can just have a list of items. Uh, it's a different way to do more than one type of criteria for the same field. Good. So now let's go back to another listing. Uh, so here's one that'll show the null. Let's try four. 45 exactly so we have is null or of course you can imagine is not null all right so i'll pick on execute and now this one does show the null right so or state is null and i'm sure i can say or the state is not null okay 
So in other words, uh, that shows everything. But um, if I want the ones that are null, we'll say state is null. And now that one is including the null. Okay, very good. Now, the next type of query I want to show you is where we can start to get subtotals of our data. So now we're going to use something that's called group by. So I'm going to go ahead and go back into our uh, examples. In this case, we'll use listing 609. All the listings uh, in the five series, those are all different functions. Um, like let's randomly double click on one of those. Uh, so this one is going to be actually a concatenation. And uh, I just know for a fact that um, in this version of the SQL Server, the concatenation is going to be with, uh, with a plus sign. So, or with the and sign actually. So instead of those two double arrows, there's two double lines, I'm going to use the and sign. Almost like you would in Excel to do a, um, a concatenation. So again, in other versions of SQL Solver, they might use those two, those two lines for the concatenation. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, get rid of some of these lines and we'll run that. Uh, so in this case, let's see what we have. So, oh yeah, so I have that comma at the end, right? Like I talked about. So now I'll execute that. Uh, so it's trying to do that alias. Uh, let's try the plus sign instead. And that one worked. So, uh, so in this version of the SQL Server, the concatenation will be the plus sign. So it took the uh, open parentheses and then the AAA and then the close bracket there, put them all together because of the plus sign. So when you look at your listings, the ones that say listing five, you know, those are all different functions. Um, so, but I really want to show you some of these group by items. Let's go to listing 609. Okay. So in this case, I want to get the number of books from the, uh, this file. So I'm using a function that's called count. I'm going to count everything. Uh, so we're going to group it by the author. So this is going to be called a, um, a query that we can do subtotals on. So I have group by. And so it's going to show you a, a different record for each um, for each author. These are called aggregate. The actual official name for these is aggregate queries. So if I take away this group by, let me take away this code for a second. And uh, we'll say from authors. And you see the various authors there, right? So let's go ahead and undo that. It's actually from the title authors table. Okay. So group by means it's going to summarize. So let's see what it looks like without that. So these are the individual records, right? Um, of course, that comma is, is uh, extraneous there. Okay. So notice how A01 is in there a couple times, A04 is in there a couple times, right? I want to get a count by author. So I'm going to go ahead and undo it to the way it was before. So you can undo several times like you like you are uh, like you can in the different programs. Good. Click on execute. Good. So now I have a count by author. Now, when we do this kind of aggregate query, you can only include certain things. You, you can include um, the, the field that you're grouping. So that's where the author ID is fine. And I can count a different field, but I can't include anything else. So if I say comma, uh, let's see what's in that table. Remember how I can look at that table, look at the columns over here. So I'll look at um, royalty share. Notice when I do start to type it in, uh, it'll try to help me in that section over there. Okay. 
So now when I run this, it's going to say that that field is not part of the aggregate because it's not in the group by and, and I'll have a count there. Now let's see if we sum that, if it let us do that. It should let me sum that field and that should be then part of the aggregate. Exactly. All right, so when you do the group by, I can use the field that I'm grouping by in the query and I can use things like count and sum, but I can't use any other fields uh, in, the, in these subtotal type of queries. Let's try another example. So I'll go to listing 611. Okay, so this one has, we're taking it from the titles table. We're grouping it by type. So first of all, look what I'll do. I want to make a new query and I'll say um, select star from titles, right? That means show all the titles and all the fields. Okay, so you can see the title ID, the title name, the type, and so on. So it looks like uh, it was by type. Then we're going to count and do sums based uh, uh, on the type. So let's go back to this other one. So it says select type, sum of the sales, count of the sales, account of the records in general. And then it's going to do some math here. It's taking the sales divided by the count, right? And then um, it's taking it from the titles table. It's even taking the average and then we're grouping it. So notice how this query has the field that we're grouping on included, that's fine. And then we have sums and counts and averages. So this would be a perfect, uh, what we call an aggregate query. So it actually summarized by type. Then I have the sum, the count, the average, and so on, right? So when we have the group by, then uh, that'll give you great ways to subtotal your data. Let's try another example. Let's go to listing 613. So in this time, so here you're going to mix and match these, right? So we have the group by, and then we have the order by. The order by always has to be last. So if I uh, try the same exact query, I'm going to get rid of that semicolon and actually try to move the group, uh, the order by over here, for example, it's the same code, but it just doesn't like it because the order by has to be last even has to be after the group by. So uh, you just want to get used to these kind of messages. And now let's see what happened. It grouped it by the type. And then uh, you can see how the top sales are up top going down because it says ordered by some of the sales descending. So you can really mix and match these as much as you wanted to. Uh, let's go to listing 613. Oh, that was listing 613. Now, another one that you might see is this. The, um, the having means that the criteria will be done after you do the subtotal. If you have the where statement, the where statement is done before it does the, the subtotal. So it'll limit the records before you do the subtotal. The having only goes with the group by, and that means the criteria is done actually after it does the subtotal. So let me show you what I mean by that. If I pick on execute, so we see all the ones that have more than three titles, right? So I'm going to get rid of that last statement there and it'll still run. Now this is showing the ones that have, you know, the, all of the authors and the number of titles. When I pick on having, that actually runs after the subtotal is done. If you have the word where in the query, that's actually, that'll limit the records before the total is done. It's, it's a subtle difference, but, but it does make a difference. I'm going to pick on execute. And then we just see the ones that have more than three titles because of the having. Okay. Now another really important section that we want to talk about here is starting to join the tables together. So your databases are going to be relational databases, which means you can join the tables together on a common field. Uh, the common field is going to be the key here. So in this case, Let's go to listing uh, 701. Okay, so we're taking um, fields from the authors table and on the publishers table. So the inner join 
means that it's only going to show the records that have a match on both sides. So there has to have a matching author and a matching publisher. So we say select AU ID authors.city from authors, enter join publishers, and then you have to tell what field is the matching field. So I say on authors.city equals publishers.city. So this way we'll be able to pick the fields from both uh, tables. The inner join means it's only going to show the records that have a match on both sides. Let's take a look at another example. So I'll go to listing 702. Now sometimes you'll see something like this. This is a way to give uh, the table an alias. So I'm saying I want the uh, first name, the last name, and the city. Now in this case, I say from authors A, the, the A is an alias for the table. So that's why it says A.city there. Instead of typing in the whole table name, I can give it an alias. Interjoin that with the publisher's table, and I'm giving the publisher's table the alias of P. And then I say on A.city equals P.city. So the reason that this one is working is because that letter A and that letter P are there. Those are called aliases for your tables. Okay, good. So let's try some more of these joins. In this case, I'd like to go to um, 707. All right. So, okay, now check this out. Here's the aliases, right? I'm taking the um, A is going to turn out to be authors. See, authors A. Title authors will be TA. All right, so the TA over here is referring to the title authors. It's going to join it on the author ID field, A dot author ID equals TA dot author ID. So you really have to be very specific here. And then this one even has an order by. So we're gonna order by the, um, the author ID and the title ID. The, the real key here is the inner join that's gonna allow us to pull the fields from more than one table. And then uh, you can see how these three fields came from the authors table and this field came from the titles table, All right? So the reason that you start to go to uh, other tables is so, you, you know, you can get information, you can get some fields from that other tables is the whole relational database concept. The key to the relational database concept is the two tables have to have a common field. Now they don't have to have the same field name. It's always nice when they do have to ha have the same field name, but they don't really have to have the same field name as long as the data is the same and they have to be the same data type. That's going to be really important when you start to do this. But you can see the syntax. Let's try uh, another join. So I'll go to listing 709. All right, so uh, I'm taking uh, these fields from the author table from authors A, inner join, publishers P. I see the alias is right. The common field is going to be the city. Oh, this one is matching on two different fields. So the city is joined uh, on the tables and the state has to match as well. So then uh, we're going to order by the AUID. So in this case, we're actually joining those two tables on two fields instead of one. Both fields have to be equivalent on both tables. All right. So sometimes your inner join can have uh, a little bit more of a complicated logic there. Let's go ahead and see listing 710. All right. So we're, we, we see the select statement. Titles T is an alias, right? I'm joining it with the publisher's table. It'll be P for the alias. The common field will be the publisher ID where state equals California or the country is not USA, Canada, or Mexico, and then we have an order by. So this is a great summary of what we talked about uh, throughout the entire session. The select is going to be your field names. Each field name is separated with a comma. You can see the T is going to come from the titles table and the P will come from the publisher's table. We tell it the table and we have the inner join. We see the alias is there. The on is the field name that's common between the two tables. Then we have a where statement for the criteria, and then we have an order by for the sort. So this is a good one where it mixes matches um, everything. 
Now, in this case, for this uh, title, for some reason, um, on the other table, the state wasn't shown. Okay, but it'll still show that record, even though uh, the state must be null there. And that's okay. So that was listing 710. Let's take a look at listing 727. I want to show you another kind of join here. Uh, so this says left adder join. So the left table is really the first table in, in the list here. It's going to be the author's table. When you have a left adder join, that means show all of the records from the author's table, even if they don't have a match in the other table. The inner join is only going to show the records that have a match on both sides. The left adder join means it's going to show all the records in the author's table, even if they don't have a matching record on the publisher's table. So in this case, they, these authors don't have a title or they don't have a publisher. All right. Uh, so now in the, in the other hand, if I did an inner join there, I'm going to type in the word inner, then it'll only show the, the ones that do have a match. You see, you see the difference, but let's do a left adder join. And then that'll show all of the authors, even if they don't have a match on the publisher's table. And then the last example, you might see something that's called a right adder join. So let's go to listing uh, 728. And then it says right adder join. So the first table that it sees in the, in the code is the left table. So the publishers will be the right table. So this will show all of the publishers, even if they don't have a match in the author's table. Yeah, okay, so now these these two publishers don't have any authors, right? But the publisher is still listed. So again, I'm gonna make that a inner join. Now we'll see less records, right? These are the ones that have a match on both sides. I'll say right adder join. And it really is the second table. I wanna see all of the publishers, even if they don't have a match in the authors table. And then you can see that gave us additional records. So the really important things that I wanted to show you today were the select statement, the order by, the where statement, the group by, and then the left joins and the inner joins and the right outer joins.